Hello, I'm Charlie Rossiter, and welcome to Poetry Spoken Here on YouTube. We're the longest-running all-poetry interview podcast in existence. Be sure to subscribe to the channel so you never miss an upload. But you don't have to wait for YouTube uploads. You can also download the show from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Enjoy the show. I'm Charlie Rossiter for Poetry Spoken Here. Octavio Paz once said, A world without poetry would be entirely possible, but it would not be worth living in. Paz is right. Life is better when poetry is part of it. This podcast is your invitation to let poetry speak to you. Today, we're going to focus on the work of Jeff Panyevash, recent poet laureate from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Jeff devoted his entire adult life to poetry and the environment. For many years, he taught the literature of ecological vision at the U of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Unfortunately, in mid-December 2014, Jeff succumbed to a long, hard battle with cancer. All his life, Jeff used his poetry as a force for his ecological activism. As long ago as 1988, he helped create the group Earth Poets and Musicians, a group that still performs each year on Earth Day in Milwaukee. Allen Ginsberg praised Jeff's writing for its Whitmanesque, Thoreauvian verve and wit. At the end of January 2015, at the annual poetry marathon at Woodland Pattern in Milwaukee, Jeff's lifelong partner, Antler, paid tribute to his beloved soulmate with commentary and with Jeff's poems. We were fortunate enough to be able to record Antler's presentation, and that's what we're going to hear right now. Thank you, Jeff, for becoming my friend 49 years ago when you were a teenage boy and I was a teenage boy. Thanks for saving me from committing suicide after I'd already tried three times unsuccessfully because I loved a young fellow who spurned me and I could not continue. I would die so he could live. Thanks for 49 years of comradeship, dear friend. Be here now. Late for my own funeral. My mother always used to say, you'll be late for your own funeral. <laughs> Dear mother, I fear my own funeral is the one thing I'll be on time for. <laughs> I just hope I don't get there early. <laughs> This is to Jeff's mother and father, and he's speaking to them. You taught my clumsy hands to form a steeple, fingers pointing upward in the wish for wings, little hands that swarmed with bugs when I picked an eyeless wren up from a gutter. You taught my knees to kneel, prepared me to embark on darkness, prepared me for bed, first and final altar, before which we are all acolytes, whispering sus gipiat. I fell asleep, hearing you awake in other rooms. Now it's my turn to hear your prayers, voices side by side, hands that quelled nightmares folded forever. I'm listening. Sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. My soul to keep, my soul to take. Now I lay me down to wake. My good night kiss, this gentle gibberish. I tuck you in, 
lay my hands on your heads, close your eyes, peer into darkness, don't be afraid. You will find each other, you will love each other, and I will be born. <laughs> message from the deep. Strolling the shore of Lake Michigan, I discover a cuneiform tablet hieroglyphed with fossilized remains of tiny lives, shell lives, clams smaller than my little fingernail embedded side by side, tossed up by Lake Michigan knowing I needed it some special miracle to re-alert me to the miracle of life. This tablet the size of my hand, not thou shalt not, lightning by biblical epic special effects. <laughs> this tablet written by the only God there is. This tablet written in shell language, tinge, with rust-colored sand, all and all in my hand, this gift from the sea, this sea-whispered me, me geological whisper, this whisper echo of the eonic earth, this heirloom from great-great-grandmother earth, this oracular telegram from the deep, this deep image washed to my feet as if directed specifically to me. This many million year memento from the ocean that was here before Lake Michigan existed. This enigma, this ancient rune, this cosmos mandala, this inevitable whatever it is. This Rosetta Stone translating the past into the present and the present into the past. This wordless dignity, this compact cemetery of lives whose tombstones are more immortal than the tombstones of humankind. We are listening to the poet Antler pay tribute to his lifelong partner, Jeff Panyevash with a reading of Jeff's poems at the annual Poetry Marathon in Woodland Pattern in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Jeff was Poet Laureate of Milwaukee when he succumbed to cancer in December 2014. The Tomb of the Unknown Poet. Why no tomb of the unknown poet? Wasn't he killed as sure as the unknown soldier? Didn't he die running wild after the wildest beauty, the same as Wilfred Owen? Didn't he step on the toes of landmine mines? Wasn't he mowed down by machine guns of mechanization? Didn't he throw himself on the grenade of scorn lobbed at poetry? No. Drape a green flag of living grass over his casket. Blow his taps on panpipes, phoenix, syrinx. Unknown poet launched into the unknown like a poem in a manila envelope addressed to immortality. Care of the worms who edit scrupulously <laughs> but send no rejection slips. <laughs> Well, Jeff, you died at twilight, at the deepest point before twilight becomes dark, with me holding you by your side, watching you take your last breath, holding you till you became cold and rigor mortis set in, and then taking off your hospital gown and with hot soapy water, washing your pitiful naked form for the last time. Give me courage to continue and give my all to poetry before the curtain drops. Uh, this poem I never saw before, I just discovered it, that he had written it. The Lover of Twilight. The Lover of Twilight could do nothing during the hour between latest late afternoon and the full dark 
of fully fallen night. The magic of that magic time freed him from all holds of time and held him in healing embrace. Like the trees outside his window, he became silent and still. The birds never sang more beautifully than then, and voices of children at play seemed just another kind of bird song. He didn't have to drop everything he was doing. Everything he was doing just dropped away. Once during his tryst with twilight, he said to himself, let there be light, let there be night, and let there be twilight. And he saw that all were good. He kept vigil to savor the fading day, letting deepening shades of dark engulf him, soothe him, console him. He wished that when his time came to die, he might pass as gracefully between life and death as the day passed between day and night. Maybe, he thought, by observing how the day did it, he could do it too. Memento Amori. Stepping into the shower, my loved one gone, I find some of my loved one's hair curled on the drain screen. How often that unintended memento annoyed me. How my loved one always forgot to pick out after showering that shed relic of my loved one's mortality. A wad of hair I regarded it then. Now I regard it a lock of hair. My loved one gone aboard a plane into the thin air of the sky, and I realize if my loved one never returned, I would fish that lock of hair out of the wastebasket and sleep with it under my pillow for the rest of my life. <laughs> so uh, I'll just read two more here. Um, this is the I am, who am song. God in the Old Testament was fond of saying, I am who am. The I am who am song. I am who am, you am who am, he am who am, she am who am, it am who am, we am who am. I am who am, you am, he am, she am, it and we. I am who am, you am who am, he am who am, she am who am, it am who am, we am who am. I am, you am, who was, who will be. <laughs> okay, well, I'll close with this. This is a poem that I forgot about by Jeff. This was written in the 70s. Um, picture Michelangelo's Pieta with a beautiful girl uh, holding a beautiful young man draped over her lap. Descent from the cross. We want to sprawl, magnificent and spent, across the lap of all love. And we want to rock all agony in our arms. We want to be beyond all wanting, beyond hate contemplating pain and nothing to take each other from us, neither resurrection nor decay. Like fierce widows who won't allow the coffin closed, we'd throw ourselves on the bosom of our life, defending it from all who would call it dead. And no finger could be lifted to solve the secret we contain, haloed in impenetrable tenderness, secret that resolves all cruelty into calm. We remain. The ages pass, heads bowed. Thank you.
You are listening to Poetry Spoken Here. And now, I'd like to turn to a new book by Gary Snyder. Snyder's first book, Rip Rap and Cold Mountain Poems, published in 1959, did much to bring the reclusive Chinese poet Han Shan to the awareness of the English-speaking world. In the mid-1970s, his Turtle Island was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. In all, he has authored over a dozen books of poetry and prose, including The Practice of the Wild, one of the more influential books about the environment in the last half century. His book-length poem, Mountains and Rivers Without End, Forty Years in the Writing, was published to critical acclaim in 1996. This latest book, This Present Moment, has just been published by Counterpoint, and it is a pleasure. In it, Snyder once again does what he does so well, connecting himself and the reader with nature, reminding us of our place in the universe and in the long stretch of time. Snyder is a master at first-hand descriptions of being in nature. Here's an example from a poem that describes a walk down the entire length of the Elwha River. Walking the Long and Shady Elwha. Elwha, from its source, thread white falls out of snow tunnel mouths with cloud mist breath, saddles of deep snow on ridges. Big dug fur in this valley, deep grooved bark It adapts, where Sitka spruce often can't. Three days on the trail. He describes some more of the journey and finally ends with, about 1230, come to Whiskey Bend, that lowland smell. That lowland smell, that phrase is characteristic Snyder. I'm not sure what to call it, I don't think of it as a name, as a poetic device, but it's something he does. A straight, emphatic statement that brings the scene home. Snyder has long been interested in Asian cultures. Back in his 20s, he spent several years in Japan studying Zen. Later, he studied ink and wash painting under Chiura Obata the Japanese-American artist known for his portrayals of grand naturescapes, many of them in Yosemite National Park. Any poem represents a sum of a poet's life experiences. That notion is evident in the poem Chiara Obata's Moon. In it, Gary tells us he's at Lake Tahoe, walking the busy shoreline highway. He's staying at the Firelight Lodge, which is uh, cramped for space, and he says, built around an empty pool. He comes upon a little restaurant, and this is what he says. Walking up on a sign says, Sancho's Tacos, a tiny storefront and a house, off to the southwest planet Venus, really bright. Sky so clear and purple-violet tonight. Two pine trunks and that early crescent moon. The silhouetted ponderosa pine, mature and tall. I make my way into Sancho's. I hadn't planned to, but it's got a menu more than tacos. Three youthful outdoor-clad enthusiasts just back from ridgetop hike are laughing and drinking in the corner. He describes having his meal of fish, which is very good, and then uh, goes back out into the Lake Tahoe night, saying, Outside on the deck, the moon and Venus have shifted. I see Chiura Obata's woodblock of dusk at Yosemite, dated 1930. The soaring blue cliff the pines, the new moon. And 
finally, the book ends with a poem, Go Now. This poem is about the death and cremation of his beloved wife, Carol Coda. It is a longer poem, and it alone is worth the price of the book. He begins by setting the scene about the death and the death of a lover. It's not some vague meditation or a homily, not irony, no God or enlightenment or acceptance or struggle with the end of our life. It's about how the eyes sink back and the teeth stand out after a few warm days. Her last breath, and I still wasn't ready for that breath, that last to come at last after ten long years. He then describes the heart-wrenching days toward the end and talks about going to the cremation with his son, Kai. The young man at the desk and a table filling out papers, sweating as we set out the incense and bell, the candle, and I went to the light cardboard coffin and opened the lid. The smell hit like a blow. I thought the funeral home had some sort of cooling, like a walk-in. Maybe they did, but it didn't much help. He rolled it up close, slid the box in the furnace, locked down the door like loading a torpedo. We burned incense and chanted the text for impermanence, and all things who have lived, or who ever will yet, things writ only in magic, and just for the dead, not for you, dear reader. In the end, he concludes saying, still in love, being there, seeing and smelling and feeling it, thinking farewell, worth even the smell. Gary Snyder, new book, This Present Moment. You've been listening to Poetry Spoken Here. I'm Charlie Rossiter, inviting you to join us again next time to let poetry speak to you. And remember, Poetry Spoken Here is more than a podcast. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash poetry spoken here. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash poetry spoken here. For more about today's show and other programs in the Poetry Spoken Here series, as well as our blog, visit our website, Poetry Spoken Here. If you have suggestions or ideas for future podcast topics, you can write us at poetryspokenhere at gmail.com.